The scripture today comes from the book of Exodus. We are reading from the 33rd chapter, verses 12 through 23. Moses said to the Lord, See, you have said to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, if I have found favor in your sight, show me your ways, so that I may know you and find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. He said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go, do not carry us from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? unless you go with us. In this way, we shall be distinct, I and your people, from every people on the face of the earth. The Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, show me your glory. I pray. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you the name, the Lord's, and I will be gracious to whom all I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face for no one shall see and live. And the Lord continued, see there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. And Moses said, show me your glory, I pray. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of God's word. One of the beautiful things about this faith community as we're talking about beauty is that God raises up people that are on journeys growing in their faith. And we have one who will come before us today who's on a journey toward ordination. So one of the gifts of his journey is he gets to share a sermon with us. I pray that you all receive him and receive this message. We welcome at this time Minister Wei Jin. It's my honor to share my thoughts today at our church. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. The scripture today could be seen as three related sections initiated by Moses requesting, I would say Moses questioning to God. The first question is, will you come with us to show you are, we are your people? God promised to send the angel before the Israelites. The angel is the angel of punishment. Moses requests God to show the presence and go up to the promised land with him and the people. Moses also said to God, let me know your way. He would like to know the way God deal with human sin to avoid the punishment. God also tried to convince God to accept Israelites as a nation by claiming 
This nation is your people. You know what? It seems working. And God replied to Moses, Who is, who is found of the favor in God's sight, saying, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Instead of the angel, God promised to be present with the Israelites, and Moses can take a break now. Question number two. Will you be with us again and make us different from the others? Moses asked for Israelites having the favor from God as he does. For Moses, God, God's presence among the Israelites can demonstrate we shall be distinct from the rest of the people. God answered Moses saying, I have gained your favor, for you have found favor in my sight, and I, knew, I, knew, I know you by name. It sounds like Moses and Israelites and earning their privilege, despite the others, especially despite the Egyptians and the Canaanites. Question number three. Show me your glory. This is Moses' prayer. Show me your glory, I pray. And God answered to show God's goodness to him. God also mentioned in verse 19, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy to whom I show mercy. And you cannot see my face, but part of me. Moses can see God's back, but not God's face directly. The Bible assumes God has a human form, a human knowing. And from the next chapter, we might know Mount Sinai is a rock with the clefts Moses could be put in. I keep thinking, what does God's goodness mean here to respond to Moses' prayer? Does that mean grace and mercy mentioned here in the next chapter? What kind of grace and mercy, mercy is that? However, I got confused and felt there's a gap between the scripture we heard last week. So I decided to look back and I find out common missionary ignore several verses between last week and this week. I believe it is essential for us to include those ignored or missed verses and voices into our reflection today. I find out Moses carried to the template of the covenant. God's writing was engraved on those two templates. However, Moses also find out the people were celebration celebrating and worshiping the golden calf. Moses became angry and hot. He threw the templates from the hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. The people were running wild because Aaron let them do so. And that became the derision of Israelite's enemy. Moses said to the Israelite, Who is on low side? Come to me. And the son of Levi, come to him. Moses commands the son of Levi in verse 27 in chapter 20, uh, 32. Put your sword on your side, each of you. Go back and forth from gate to gate throughout the camp. And each of you kill your brother, your friend, and your neighbor. There were 3,000 people killed that day. But the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will go out of my book. But, go, but now go, lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. See, my angel shall go in front of you. Nevertheless, when the day comes for the punishment, I will punish them for their sin. And God sent a plague on the people. End of the chapter 32. In the beginning of chapter 33, God commanded Moses to lead the people up to the promised land. God won't go with them. And God said to them, I will consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. And God also said, I will drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, the Hittites, 
the parasite, the Hevite, and the Yabusite, and the people mourned that day. The scripture continued, Moses built up a tent of a meeting far off from the Israelite camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise and stand. You shall stand at the entrance of their tents and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pit of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. All the people would rise and bow down, all of them, at the entrance of their tent. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, as one speaks to a friend. For those ignored scriptures, remind me some vision or image or message that maybe we can have a further consideration. Moses is the only one who can interpret God's word and commandment to the people. Moses is only the only one who can speak to God face to face like a friend. However, I'm afraid God might not authorize Moses to initiate the civil war that the 3,000 people died and killed in one day. This incident is a justification of self-fulfilled, a self-fulfilled prophecy from Moses mentioned in chapter 32, saying, why should the Egyptian say he was with evil intent that he brought me to God? God brought them out to kill them in the mountains and so consume them from the face of the earth. As the Israelites, the Israeli Egyptians called by God to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, Moses did not know this God of Israel, Israel when God called him. Moses asked this God of Israel, When the people ask me, Who sent me here? What should I say? Who are you? God answered Moses, I am who I am. You tell them. Or you, say, you should say, I am the one, I am who I am going to be. The troubles and ten verses of the Ten Commandments mentioned in chapter 23. God spoke all those verses as following. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You should not make yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You should not bow down to them or worship them, O oh, I, the Lord of your, uh, and I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children from the, equi- uh, from the equities of the parents, to the third and the fourth generation of those who have rejected me, by showing the steadfast love to the thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandment. For me, the Israelite God does not allow any exceptions and be afraid to be known to the people in a particular image or vision. However, we are now in the interface context, especially our church is a member of the Kenwood and High Park Interface Council. I'm afraid this, this kind of God image will not be welcome. And the promised land is a, pro- is a property of God, Yahweh, Elohim, given to the Israelites. God has said so, and the rest of the people who live on the land need to live. We have heard from the news how East Turkestan and Batavian people are treated by the Chinese government, and how Rohingya people are treated by the Myanmar government nowadays. We also know the story of the first, genera- uh, the first nations, the native people in Canada, the stolen generation, the stolen children in Australia. 
is a genocide, is a crime against humanity. The God of Israel is doing the same crime against humanity. God did what to go. God did want to go with Israelites because the similarity between the Israelites and the Canaanites made God of Israel not able to tell the differences. So he, the God, do not want to go with them. God might kill them all. We still remember there are ten plagues in total in Egypt mentioned in Exodus. God killed the firstborn in Egypt in the final plague, except those who left a mark on their door. So for me, the, na- the narrative today has three roles and three characters within that. There is a racist divine, the God of Israel, who is fond of genocide and giving punishment if anyone dare not to express their fear and obedience. God said to Moses and proclaimed God's name, I will, be ge- I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. Whoever has sinned against me, I will bore out my book. Second, is a privileged leader, Moses, who is a, who is a father of God's side, who commands the son of the Levi to kill 3,000 people among themselves. He prayed for God's presence to go up with the Israelites so that the promised land, God can drive out those native people God said, Moses said to God, We shall be distinct, I and your people, from every people on the face of the earth. The third, a group of people, the Israeli Egyptians, who are afraid of the jealous God of Israel, and the cold blood leader Moses. It was a group of people struggling for their identity and survival. Their lives was in danger. They are forced to assimilate it to a nation to come, to worship a divine they could not choose freely and give up their past and the heritage. They were forced to displace and got involved in the genocide. They have nothing to say. They are silent in the whole scripture mentioned today. That remind me of one thing. Several days ago is an interesting day, so-called interesting. Last Monday, traditionally people called it Columbus Day. I read from the Wikipedia. Columbus Day is the national holiday in many countries of America. And elsewhere, which officially celebrates the anniversary of Christopher Columbus' arrival in America on October 12, 1492. However, right now more and more people call it Indigenous People's Day. I also read the proclamations from the White House and the news from different channels about this day. According to USA Today, a news channel, an article titled, Trump accused radical activists of trying to undermine his world's legacy in holiday proclamation. Summarized the leader of the United States. He said, sadly, in recent years, radical activists has sought out to undermine Christopher Columbus' legacy. Those extremists seek to replace discussions of his vast contributions with the talk of failings. His discoveries with a lot of effort and achievement with the transgressions. Advocates for Native Americans have sought to change the federal holiday to Indigenous People's State 
arguing that celebrating Columbus ignored the explorer's widespread use of slavery and genocide against indigenous populations during the exhibitions of America. In the U.S., the discovery doctrine or the doctrine of discovery is a series of decisions expounded by the United States Supreme Court, which might also be supported by Christian doctrines and theology, depending on their understanding of the Bible, such as the scripture today. Discovery doctrine, another quote from Wikipedia, again, explain and apply the way the colonial powers lay claim to lands belonging to the foreign sovereign nations during the age of discovery, under its title to lands led with the government whose subjects traveled and occupied a territory whose inhabitants were not subjected were not subjects of European Christian monarch. The doctrine has been primarily used to support the decisions invalidating or ignoring Aboriginal possessions of the land in favor of modern colonial imperial governments. I realize, President, I realize that President Trump might be right because he stands with the Supreme Court. Two months ago, Chicago Mayor Lightfoot removed the Christopher Columbus statues from different locations in this city in order to protect, so-called protect, the city's properties. The Black Lives Matter movement was hot at that time, not only in Chicago, but also in this country and the world wide. However, I also read an article from Chicago Sometimes titled, Defiant, proud Italian Americans celebrate Columbus Day. I quote from this article. Those Italian Americans sang Italian love songs. They wore red, white, and green face masks, face masks. And though their hero has been temporarily banished, they were defiant. One of the people say, we are keeping in positive, but that does not mean we are giving in. You may take our statue, but you will neither destroy our faith or harm our spirit. A short while later, a clan of the putty bark broke out among a gallery of several hundred clusters around a park there. Around the statue should be there, but right now it's empty. Sadly, do you hear anything from the silent Native Americans? We can hardly remember their name who lived in Chicago before. Ironically, Chicago is a name from the indigenous people, from their term, their daily language. So why is the glory that we should pray for our society today? Will that be a prayer for another superpower who can decide right or wrong and give the punishment randomly? Will that be a prayer for another genocide? Will that be a prayer for another dictator, a sole interpreter of the divine who can behave in the name of the Almighty God? Would that be a prayer for another privilege and asking for the favor in God's sight? Some of mine suggest something like this. God in the Old Testament is a very brutal, crucial God. So we Christians prefer the God in the New Testament, especially Jesus, the Son of God. Theologian has informed us and tried to remind us Moses and Jesus have many things in common in the Bible. The person who can talk to God directly represents God's presence. Stay away from the people sometimes for 40 days. 
encounter God on the mountain, their faith will change the color. It seems Moses in the Old Testament very similar with the Jesus in the New Testament. On the one hand, according to the Gospel, according to the John, chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said to the people, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to Father except through me. The only path and the only chosen one, the one that God made in our image, early Jesus' followers encounter this God's image talk to each other face to face like a friend, eat and drink together, and they testified in New Testament. However, this experience has become a privilege, the foundation of cultural genocide and the roots of a colonization. Moses and Jesus seem to perform and represent a similar character and ideology, in my opinion. On the other hand, Moses struggling with the alienations from his heritage, an Israeli Egyptian, and seeking his true identity give us an example of the, of the spirit to, to, straddle, to straddle with the domination, the death of the Jesus, the climate of the climax of his, of his mysteries also provide us with another example of the intentionally giving up one's privilege. I think and I believe this might be the glory and goodness we should pray. Let us pray. God of many names, the God to be, the God to come, the God of love and justice. Hear our hearts, hear our struggles, and hear, listen from the silence. Amen.